I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Nicaragua. Today, I'm here with Paul Baker in Casa Benjamin Linder in Managua. Paul has a really interesting history, both personal and as part of the pan-Latin American kind of revolution, uh, if that's a good way to put it. And we're going to get more of his words on that. We're going to talk about his book a little bit uh, and his upcoming interview with Nika Rumba, all right after the book. All right, we're back with Paul. We are here in Casa Benjamin Linder. This is a beautiful hostel or guest house, as they officially call it, uh, but in the northwest corner of Managua. It actually so far northwest, I almost felt like we were coming into Leon. Uh, but this is a beautiful spot. We have some shots of the murals. We have one behind us. Uh, they're famous for their murals, both inside and out. It's right in the city, so this is an interesting location. But they have like this is kind of an, an oasis in the city here. This Absolutely. is really it's really super. Yeah, really, I really love it. Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm impressed. I had no idea this was here. I was aware of Casa Bedlinder, but I was I had no idea what it was like inside. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we'll we'll give a quick shout out to them if you're looking for a hostel here in Managua. Of course, wonderful option, nice people. Um, but also, if you're looking for, I understand, like tours, like like less touristy tours, but if you're looking for getting more information on, say, history of, of Nicaragua, history of the revolution, things like that, like really getting sure. into kind of the Nicaraguan experience beyond seeing a volcano and doing some, you know, volcano boarding or checking out the beach, uh, which of course are great things to do in Nicaragua, but there's so much more to Nicaragua that we often overlook and obviously you know you can you kind of peel back the layers and there's yeah. first there's the beaches and the volcanoes and the colonial structures and then there's the history of the <laughs> of the colonial wars and then there's the history of central america and then you find the you know the the kind of the production layer of coffee and tobacco and chocolate and then you pull back the layers and you're like in the more recent history and the the ongoing cultural heritage and and honestly nicaragua is such a vibrant place today so many so many places around the world have not had recent upheaval and Nicaragua as a country really is only just past 200 years, 1821. Uh, and even in 1821, they weren't exactly a country. They were with the Central American Republic for a few years. So it's, uh, it's uh, I'm sorry, the Central American Federation for a few years. So it's really right at 200 years of, of self-governance, which makes it relatively young in that sense uh, and, and has had so much upheaval, so many things going on. Uh, which is where Paul comes in, but it's uh, uh, it's still a country that's still defining itself in so many ways, or has just recently defined itself, and is uh, creating uh, sort of a, uh, an impression on the world stage. I guess like it's it's uh, hard it's hard to imagine. I think for a lot of my audience, the biggest bulk of my audience is American and Canadian. Probably 60, 70 percent of my viewers are are from North America, and those countries have had so long since they were at that point, right? Mm -hmm. They were kind of making those impressions on the world stage in say 1820, right. or in Canada's case, 1880. Right. Um, and uh, so we're many generations past the point where we're kind of defining ourselves and, and telling the world who we are. Uh, but Nicaragua is still at that point where it's just sort of gotten its feet under it, just sort of kind of defined itself, and now is really much in this position of taking that from being an internalization process to being an externalization process and starting to be like, hey, you know, greater world, this is who Nicaragua is and this is what we're about and, and this is kind of, I don't know where we're going and, and who we are culturally, so that's um, very important. And uh, I think you play very much into that yeah, uh, as kind of a, a character of the of the culture. A I, <laughs> I was laughing when you were going through all of the onions, or the layers <laughs> of the onion. Then you come, I was going to say, to uh, a kind of an old relic as the last of the onions. Well, may, maybe not even the last of the onions, but I guess that, that defines me in many respects, you know. Um, that's great to be with you, buddy. Yeah. I, you know, this is really fun. I'm glad you're and, able to come out. And, and before we get into it, I just want to say, um, for those who have not checked out or haven't had plans to check out um, our sister channel, which is generally in Spanish, but it's mostly music, mm -hmm. Nika Rumba, um, a lot of our audience is not normally looking at that. If you speak Spanish uh, or are interested in music, we have lots of concerts and things. You can see what music is like in Nicaragua. We try to uh, highlight artists and concerts and events um, to kind of get a cultural awareness out. 
but we're much more Nicaraguan content, like for Nicaraguans. Yeah. Uh, but Paul is going to be um, in the upcoming, we're not sure exactly when, but in the next several weeks, uh, Marcella, who does the Spanish language interviews there, as she has done in the past with like Cadejo, for example, um, and coincidentally, I'm recording an anniversary show of Cadejo tonight, oh. so Nika Rumba is very busy. Uh, but Nika Rumba is going to have a Spanish language interview, probably a bit more in depth, with Paul coming up sometime in the next several weeks. So if that's something that you're interested in in Spanish uh, or want to see the translation of, uh, just be sure to subscribe over there uh, and have a more expansive um, Paul experience. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, that was it, guys. Lovely to, <laughs> lovely to see you. That's where we're going to put up on the screen the Paul experience. Yeah, there we are. As a that's that's thing, what yeah. Paul over now, maybe. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, great well, to have you with us. Uh, yeah. Maybe best to start with, because you have a really interesting kind of long and late adolescent uh, sort, of, sort of starting point to things. 1961. 1961? Yes. Remind me. In, 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 you were in Scotland <laughs> at the time. Where is 1961? So long ago. So there was a small country also with blue and white oh, um, so in the north blue. of the British Isles. Indeed there was. And still <laughs> vaguely there. But what I wanted to say just before that, if I may, the Casa Ben Linder is an, astor an astonishing place uh, in many respects. Uh, it was the heart of uh, the um, foreign secretary of Nicaragua, uh, Padre Miguel de Scotto. He used to work here, it was his center. But prior to that, it was actually, it belonged to a friend of the dictator and it was taken over during the revolution. So it's actually itself uh, how would you say, grown out of the revolution, this, this center. <laughs> and we used to, when I say we, the people who lived here in solidarity with the revolution during the 80s, during Reagan-Bush war, we tend to say that rather than the Contra war, but most people know it as the Contra war, right? Oliver North and all of those super people. And um, we used to have every Thursday morning, mm -hmm. we would have a demo outside the U.S. Embassy, which is just up the road. Yeah, very close. Yeah. And um, so that this was the base. This, we bought, I mean, I say we, I had nothing to do with it, but the, the, the Solidarity community bought this place as a base for the Solidarity people living here. And we had these demos, and then once that kind of ceased to happen, then we had regular um, charlas here every week about different aspects of Nicaragua, and particularly, obviously, history of the revolution, and particularly Ben Linda himself, who was a tremendously interesting young guy. He came, he qualified in Portland, Oregon, as a as an electrical, electrical engineer. Electrical engineer, I believe. Yeah. That's right. And he came to Nicaragua to try to bring um, energy, uh, renewable energy from small streams to uh, remote communities. Small scale hydroelectric. Yeah, that's what he uh, is. It's just a technical guy we need. You see, yeah, he's got all the, <laughs> all the jargon. Yeah, so basically he was putting, he and a couple of friends, Sergio uh, Rosales and Pablo Hernandez, were putting in a small turbine in the stream or making soundings for doing that. And they were ambushed by Contra forces, tortured and murdered. So this place is in honor of him in a large measure. And the great thing about Ben was that not only was he a you know, serious engineer type and doing all this super stuff, he was also a clown and a juggler. And there's a great mural, maybe you can take a photo of it yeah, later, for sure. of him on his unicycle in his clown costume leading the children like the Pied Piper of Hamlin <laughs> to get vaccinated, okay? So uh -huh. he was did that, even use... That would have been the polio era. I imagine, and it was during the, the Contra times. So right. it would be, so he was killed in 87, so... 87, and yeah. so he was born in 1960 because he was 27 when he was killed. Yeah, well, you know more than I am now. So this whole place is, is redolent and, uh, you know, echoing with all kinds of, not only bird song in the present, but um, tremendous memories of really wonderful people. Padre Miguel himself died about five years ago, of course. Oh. Uh, he was um, elected by acclamation Secretary General of the United Nations, in fact, oh, for a year. Wow. And so he was a very important guy. And he was just the last thing about him that I always loved. He was the guy that took the United States to uh, the International Court of Justice for terrorism 
and the uh, for, during Contra War, mining of international waters was the technical charge, and we are still waiting on our indemnity. Right. So I'm sure you're going to write me a check at the end of this interview. <laughs> Seventeen billion dollars then, like. How much would that be worth uh, today, so buddy? If it was, it, oh, I think the award was in the 90s, so well, uh, it's probably only about double, about 35 billion. Oh, well, oh, well, I, we won't bother then in that. <laughs> you know, I was thought it was going to be something peanuts. serious. <laughs> anyway, so that's all about that. Yeah. So, Paul, tell us about 1961, oh, yeah, Scotland. 1961, this Scotland. is uh, important background, kind of yes, like how this indeed, all comes about. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I, interestingly enough, I think, from one point of view, looking back, I came from a very conservative background. I would never, in the, you know, in the week, month of Sundays, think of ever being involved in any kind of a revolution, let alone in a foreign country where I didn't even speak the language. Right? Although conservative Scottish yeah. is kind of revolutionary. Oh well, then I, I mean, suppose you're we thinking about um, what was his name, Mel Gibson. And, uh, and I never think about Mel Gibson, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> was that, was it the guy that did it, William it, it, Wallace? Yes, William uh, Wallace. Yeah. Freedom, yeah, right, right, like a lot of rubbish. Yeah. So Scotland, yeah, was was always a bit uppity because we, the original English. I'm actually originally English, but I moved to Scotland because I couldn't bear being such an imperialist. And, <laughs> and um, I'm actually Scottish, but never grew up there. Yeah. Well, never mind. <laughs> we'll forgive you. Um, <laughs> and I hope you got some whiskey in your flask, laddie. Um, so. Uh, um, Coming from a very conservative background, uh, particularly religious, and um, when I'd finished school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I wandered off into the woods, the way one does, and uh, just worked as a forestry laborer, really, mm -hmm. planting trees and stuff like that. And then the Lord spoke to me. Can you play the Lord? We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. Paul, we'll do it. You've, you've been in the woods too long. You have a great beard for the Lord. Yeah. So yeah. if you can imagine, here's the Lord. Now, basically, it was just that, that, um, you know, I was tootling around, cutting down trees or whatever I was doing. And suddenly I thought, well, oh, the Lord said to me, however, however you define it, what the heck are you doing here? You did pretty well in school. What are you doing being a mere laborer? And so being a conservative Catholic, I thought to myself, well, what do I do? You know, I need to use my, my, my gifts that have been given to me by the Lord. And so, okay, become a priest. What's the best kind of a priest? A monastic priest. Okay, what's the best kind of monasticism? A hermit. So within about a week, I was, I was straight. I was incarcerating myself <laughs> from the, you know, the, this glorious woods forestry. <laughs> with the birds and the trees and all the rest of it. And I'm incarcerating myself in a little cell in the only uh, Carthusian monastery, they're called, which is a kind of community of hermits, if you can imagine it. It's kind of weird. You have the central church and you have cells, which are little tiny cottages all the way around the cloister guards, right? Mm -hmm. And you lock yourself in there by your own hand. The door is not locked. And you do that for life. And I was at that point 21 or 2. So, you know, it was a long way to go. You and were born in? I was born in 39. 39, okay, so you could have been 22, because this is 1961. Yeah. Because I've read his book. I was just about 20. <laughs> you, know, you know, a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, it was probably, you know, who knows. But that's, you know, at 20 or 20, 20, 21, 22, it's probably not a good idea to lock yourself away for the rest of your life <laughs> with nobody to talk to and thick walls that nobody can hear you through when you're screaming and with only two meals a day. And worst of all, you have to get up twice every 24 hours. Yeah. Very exciting. Because you're expected to pray about three hours in the middle of the night at yeah, about 10 o'clock. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And the, the thing about it was absolutely, it was very cold because it's in a cold part of the world. And the church itself had never been heated. It was one of these old great Gothic monstrosities. Yeah. And um, so it was solid stone, which had been kind of like more or less refrigerated right. for the whole of its life. So you'd go from the cell, which was relatively warm, because you had a little, a little stove. You know, <laughs> One would hope. Right? You would go to this <laughs> church for three hours. And you go, went to bed at about seven, got up about 10, went to the church for about three hours, got back to cell, 
And as you can imagine, when you got back to seven, you were like an iceberg. So trying to get back to sleep before they woke you up again at six was like, and you also had to actually say some more prayers getting back to church and to yourself. And so it was a real torture. And, you know, that it's not a good thing to do. Anyone that's thinking of it, I would not really recommend it. At that, that time, there were only, I think, 2,000 in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And I am sure they're down to about four by now. <laughs> Anyway, you have wow. to be a, a masochist. I think in, yeah. in many senses I'm a masochist. <laughs> anyway, so that was the beginning of it all. Okay. Yeah, so I am locked away in my cell. So how do we get from there to here? You that, is a, that is a good question. Yeah, well, you go quietly mad. That's what you do. So That's I, very British. Everyone else goes very, very, I know, just yeah. straight to mad. You Yanks, the British yeah, are very quietly. Yanks always do that. But we're, you know, we're British. <laughs> there was, I don't know if you ever came across it, but there was a very funny, well, a funny title for a sitcom a long time ago. And it, it was about going on holiday to places like Spain, you know, kind of really foreign, scary, uh, what should we say, loose living places. And the, it was, this is way back. And it, the title of the thing was, no sex, please. We're British. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm familiar. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, brilliant title. And it's the same sort of thing, you know, so we only go quietly mad. And especially in a monastery where you're in, in a cell, which it literally was, with walls about this thick, right? And no, you know, you could knock on them with your head, as I did, which is why not, not so much hair as I used to. And, um, but luckily, they had a system because, you know, this is obviously, without being too ridic ridiculous about it, a pretty extreme way of life, and you have to be guided into it. So there was an older monk whose job was to come around and see if he was still living, you know. <laughs> and so he, his name was Father Joseph. He was a really interesting guy from Australia. And um, he, not that that's particularly relevant here, um, he... <laughs> After about three months, three months it was wonderful because, you know, I was basically fulfilling the Catholic boys, you know, as a pre I was going to be a priest, I was a monk and I was number one in the monk hierarchy, I was kind of the Mount Everest of monkery and the next step was heaven after all. So, you know, I only had to live a few years and I'd be there. So, um, for the first three months or so, it was wonderful. It was very, it was a magical time, actually. But then suddenly, walking into the cell one day, or crossing, the, we had to cross the threshold vaguely from time to time. We weren't entirely hermits because we went to the central church for the praying. Um, it was like a cold, uh, um, walking into an ice bath. It was really cold. Like somebody punched me in the stomach, and you suddenly—it was suddenly the realization: Hey, dude, you're going to be here for the rest of your life. Are you crazy? And so I, I then went quiet and mad for a couple more months until Father Joseph came and sprung me, and chucked me out. Basically, <laughs> they said, "If we stay here, you will go mad." And we'd rather not have absolutely mad people here. You know, <laughs> we're all partly mad, but we—you know—you don't need to be here. So they sprung me out. I went home. I can still remember knocking on, going to the front door, and you know. Everyone thought I was still there. My mom opens the door and she says, Oh, Anthony. She said my original name was Anthony. And, you know, and then that was weird too, because I was pretty far gone. And so every time I went to try and get a job, I remember one guy in an interview, he said, I don't think you should be, I think you're mad. He said, like the interviewer, it was not very kind, I thought, <laughs> looking back, you know, well, British can be a, a straight, but he was probably an American now, I come to think of it. Uh, anyway, so eventually what happened was that, um, because I was convinced that I jumped off the Lord's train and mm -hmm. it was going on and I should run after it and try and catch up with it. So at the next stop, <laughs> as it were, I got back on it. And um, instead of becoming a total hermit, I became a total communal person. Because the next stop down the, from Mount Everest, whatever is the next? What, K2. Okay, well, the next step down, whichever it is, is called the Trappist, the Cistercians. And they are com totally communal, whereas the original, the Carthusians are almost in exclusively um, hermetical. And that was much better because you were actually working a farm. We didn't have a, we had no outside ministry, so we, but we were working a farm because 
um, for various reasons. And so I used to drive tractors and chop down trees and do all the kinds of things we guys love to do. <laughs> uh, and um, But we were not allowed to speak to one another. So it was kind of an interesting place altogether. Stayed there about eight years. And why did I leave, you ask? Why did you leave? Oh, thank you. That was a very impressive the way you're interviewing me. I really know. <laughs> Bob Dylan! So he turns up at the monastery, doesn't he? Along with Joan Baez, you see. And I think, oh, this is interesting, because he's singing Blowing in the Wind. Okay. And um, there was one line, there are many lines, there are many questions in Blowing in the Wind. You te one tends to dismiss it. Oh, listen, here comes the thunder. That was, that was real thunder. That was good, yeah. One tends to dismiss it as, you know, old hat. But there was one line in particular. How many times must a man turn his head pretending he just doesn't see? Right. And Bob has probably forgotten it. He says he's the worst at remembering. You remember when somebody forgot his, uh, what was her name, that lady, she, a singer who forgot the words of, um, when he, she was accepting the, um, Patsy Smith. She, okay. was, she was accepting the um, Nobel Prize for Bob. Ah, and she ah. forgot the words to the hard rains are going to fall. And he said, no, don't worry about it. I can never remember my own lyrics either. <laughs> it was really sweet. Anyway, so along comes old Bob, and he's singing this song. And he had been preceded the month before by Joan Baez. Now, you why wonder, in a monastery dedicated to celibacy and the total exclusion of the female species, why would Joan Baez be present? Well, uh, um, the monastery was totally enclosed. We had no external um, ministry, no parish, no school, no nothing. But we did have a pope, and the pope was John Twenty Third. And John Twenty Third suddenly said he was no geezer. They thought he'd just be a sleeper, sleeper till the next guy, the next miserable git got in. <laughs> Excuse my language. And but it, he said he said no. We got to open the windows of the church. He was about seventy odds. And it was just a total surprise. And that included the, the contemplative monasteries, as we were called, the, the contemplative mon way of life. Yeah. And so what it entailed was that we were supposed to open up to the world. Not We weren't to go out dancing every night or drinking with too much whiskey or anything like that. But it meant that we were finally allowed to actually hear from the world that we were praying for. So we got this really milk and water a uh, missionary magazine, <laughs> and that was our first contact with the world. You know? <laughs> and of course it was full of pious, pious whatnots. But it had one, the first month it had an article on Joan Baez and the Pete's Folk Song Movement. And the second month it had an article on Bob Dylan. <laughs> so thus primed, and we were supposed to start not gabbing away, because we were still supposed to be silent, but we were supposed to engage in guided discussions about the purpose of the life and should we really be uh, withdrawn, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because people were saying, we, one of, among uh, the young monks actually, we had this, we were living in a farm out in the countryside, okay, with a big old farm and, you know, um, uh, lots of sheep, lots of cattle, and we were growing barley for whiskey, can you imagine? And all the rest of it. And, um, a group of us started getting together saying, wait a minute, the desert of the modern times is the inner city. What are we doing out here? When, you know, this is just, we're just cozy. We're just cozy guys. We don't happen to, you know, we like living more or less in community. We're not interested in sex. So we, we're happy to live here. And so there was that beginnings of a movement. And so when Dylan, particularly Dylan's song arrived, mm -hmm. it really struck a chord. I've heard. And, um, it, the way he actually arrived, I'm sure you're dying to know, he didn't really present himself to become a monk. He actually arrived in the shape of my sister, Christine. Christine is a year older than I, and she has always been a tremendous support. And on one of the very rare family visits, she brought a tape of Dylan singing. I think it was the freewheeling Bob Dylan, the second album, and that had blown in the wind. And so it was really entertaining. Of course, we remember Bob's glorious voice. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we took it, we used to practice Gregorian chant, which was, of course, our, our music. 
that kind of beautiful stuff. That kind of stuff. So we took the tape of Bob to play in our Gregorian chant room, and Bob came out of the speakers like Bob. You know, we couldn't have. Oh, what the hell is this racket? And so that really set the, the cat among the pigeons, and the abbot heard about it, we got hold over the coals. But in those days, things were beginning to... They would, a lot of people had joined the monasteries, the Trappists, as they're usually called, Cistercians, Trappists, uh, for a French monastery, Notre Dame de la Trappe, which had a really savage abbot who introduced a really savage um, reform because the Benedictines had there been before and they were all getting too lax. And so it, it's usually called the Trappists. And they were pretty hard, hard, you know, hardcore. But the, the, many people had joined the monastery after the Second World War mm -hmm. as a kind of, as you know, to heal themselves, really. And so they, it became evident as, as Pope John Pope John's reform came, in, 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 there was a Second Vatican Council and all kinds of things, and these discussions, that a, a, quite a, about half the monastery really shouldn't have been there, right? And so we, when I joined, there were 66, from the abbot to, the, to, to me, the most used. Uh, when I left, after about, um, let's see, I must have met Bob right around 66, 67, 68, left in 70. There were only 30. So the, a little bit less so than many of, yeah, so many of those guys who had joined, who had become professed, fully professed monks, who had become priests, just lost it. And they just left. And some of them, I, I, you know, some of them became parish priests. Others became laicized, got married and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, because I'd never taken final vows, luckily, <laughs> I went straight out and found myself a girl. <laughs> <laughs> the way one does <laughs> after 10 years, after eight years, right? And uh, so then um, life ensued and um, got together with someone for quite a while and then you know, then um, I can't even remember what happened next. Oh, of course, I've forgotten the most important thing, la guitarra. Ah, see? Si. Yeah, la guitarra. So this guitar is due to Bob also. Bob is the father of this guitar. Okay, because hearing these songs, thanks to Christine, I thought, oh, this is what I want to do, sing a few protest songs in a silent monastery. Yeah, great. So. I, they, we had no money, and in any case, you know, it seemed because we were beginning to realize there were people dying of hunger. For, you know, a hundred hundred pounds, like for a guitar, would keep a whole family going for a month in Nicaragua or wherever it was at the time. We were mostly focused on Africa because of this opening up. You know, that was what the the um, the what you call it the missionary magazine was That's going it. on about you know, stuff in, in Africa and so on. Uh, to do it credit, justice. And so, what do you do? And so I was walking past the Lord. Here comes the Lord again. I was walking. <laughs> it's just wonderful what you can attribute to him, isn't it? So here was I walking past the garbage, monastic garbage dump one day. And there on the garbage dump, was it, um, what is it? Bob, um, uh, the, the, the drawer from the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You no, know, I'm thinking oh. of, of um, not Woody Guthrie, the other guy. Um, Arlo Guthrie, oh, and there on the side of the side road was another pile of garbage, and rather than bring that one up, we decided to throw us down, and that's what we did. And so here on the bottom of the, or on the top of this heap of garbage, there was a broken table leg, and there it is, right there. And there was the sides, uh, bits of cuts, as we would call them, we carpenters, of uh, chapel flooring. They had obviously renewed parts of the chapel flooring. So here you have the offcuts of the chapel flooring. And lo and behold, as my uh, wonderful co-host co is eventually going to be able to say something, <laughs> um, uh, has reminded us there was an old desk drawer. And there's the old desk drawer. And best of all, on the garbage tip, <laughs> there was, can anybody guess? The abbot's 
Are you <laughs> cheating? Okay. The <laughs> abbot's retired mahogany toilet seat, which is represented here by this tiny uh, table. Uh, it just shows what kind of a carpenter I was to reduce an entire toilet seat to that. <laughs> and the, of course, the wonderful thing about it, so then I was able to start strumming and, you know, trying to play blowing in the wind and trying to sing like Bob, like I don't think. And, um, but it, the lovely thing about it is it, it actually has remarkably fine tone for... For scrap wood. Such a bunch of crap, yeah. And the point about that is that it wasn't actually crap. When you looked at the wood, you cleaned it up, and you know, this I believe is some kind of teak, possibly, no, probably not. We're not quite sure what that is. This is some kind of mahogany or teak or cedar. And this was mahogany, is mahogany. And you looked at them and you realized, we're throwing away so much beauty. What are we doing? Oh, yeah. We had to take a brief break because the rain was intense for a little bit. Uh, so we're back and uh, hopefully we're going to squeeze them in. There's a lot of thunder. There's a potential yet for a lot of rain. Uh, but we had to take a good hour off uh, because there was no way you were going to hear us. So, Paul, um, after your adventures in the monastery, these chairs are, are an adventure in themselves. <laughs> uh, so you came to Nicaragua in 1986. You were already involved um, in Los Angeles. Um, with uh, the Salvadoran community, yeah. Let's, uh, maybe yeah. maybe tell us a little bit about what what brought you to Los Angeles. And yeah, it's quite fascinating actually. I you mentioned the book I wrote. Yeah, um, it's, it's called Song in High Summer. And uh, um, it was just going to be you know well I'd got very involved with music. Chile and exiles was where it really started. I was working and living in Edinburgh, and. Um, you know, having come out of the monastery and, and so on and so on. And um, in 1973, September, there was this terrible coup in Chile where um, the Nixon Kissinger essentially manipulated with Pinochet a coup, a military coup. And it was absolutely ghastly. And a great singer-songwriter poet, Victor Jara, uh, one of the great seminal um, musician-songwriters of Latin America, who was singing uh, about kids with no food, singing about beauty, singing about love, singing about the human experience. and. Um, was murdered, tortured in the most horrible way, and killed uh, in one of the stadia, which he had actually sung in. It was a, it was a basketball stadium with about 5,000 people, seating about 5,000 people. He was captured, he, was, uh, he, helped, he worked in the university, uh, technical university. They captured him and took him there. They recognized him and set him aside for special treatment for three or so days. And um, there's this terrible story of how they broke his hands and said, sing now if you can, you bastard, and stuff like that. And he did. It was amazingly courageous. And he sang for his fellow prisoners. Uh, Arlo Guthrie wrote uh, music to a poem, uh, Victor Jara of Chile. Anyway, that's what happened. And it was absolutely ghastly. And then they played Russian roulette with him. And you can imagine you don't even have to have a bullet in the gun, right? So you can play it for a hundred times, yeah. And imagine the terror of that. And then eventually when he was moribund, they machine gunned him to death. And it, people came exiles from Chile because then the repression was enormous. And two, 200,000 Chileans went into exile and thousands of them disappeared. And still to this day, Many Chileans don't know where, where their beloved, their loved ones are. And anyway, so Carlos and Giovanna, Margarita and Gabriel came to Edinburgh, where we were living. And they sang Victor Cara. And I was already, you know, trying to imitate Bob Dylan. I thought, well, you know, can't do Bob. Victor's much my, more my kind of stuff, <laughs> my kind of voice, yeah. So I started learning his songs. And because of that, 
when um, there was a whole peace march thing set up for coming to Nicaragua because I said to the Chileans, well, I want to go to Chile. And they said, you do not want to go to Chile. Pinochet was still dictator at the time. If you go to Chile, you will not come back. Where the revolution is, it's fascinating, the one revolution, as it were, moving from or springing up in different countries, so is in Nicaragua. We're talking 19, where are we now? We're early 80s now, yeah. Um, yeah, because in 1979 there was the... the um... In 1979 was the revolution, and Nicaragua yes, right. uh, came into uh, being able to form their own government for the first time in, saying, in uh, generations. Yeah. Uh, but then starting in 1980-ish, late 79, early 80, um, the, the change was up until 79, it was a U.S.-backed dictator, and the United States was treating Nicaragua as a colony. Yeah. So it was a it was a colonial, and Nicaragua did not have its own government, and there was a war leading up to that point. In 1979, Nicaragua won the war against the United States, uh, partially due to the exposure of what was happening in in Managua. Finally, made it to the American public, and the American public, knowing that similar things that what had happened in Vietnam was now occurring, and that they had been lied to, suddenly the U.S. had to pull out because because America knew suddenly what they yeah, were doing, really good um, the, the assassinations of the American journalists um, at the airport, right. for example. Right, Bill, what was his name? Uh, Stewart. Stewart, yeah. Um, and the ABC News crew who put that live on the news in the United States called into the U.S. and said, don't, don't do the feedback loop, don't do the, the censor loop, go live, we have to go live. And um, so in 1979, Nicaragua for the first time was in a position to form their own government, which of course took time, like you can't just do that overnight. Right. Uh, so by roughly 1980, mm -hmm. um, Nicaragua had a uh, uh, interim government. So Nicaragua was self-governing at that point, but, but still establishing itself. And at that, roughly immediately, the United States began funding a new war in Nicaragua. We see it as a new war, right? Like it, both sides see it as two separate conflicts, but one was uh, colonial Nicaragua, where the United States as the colonial power was waging a war against the people who wanted to have a democratic government. Um, and then it became a war of a foreign power of the United States backing revolutionaries attempting to overthrow an elected government yeah. of the people um, in Nicaragua. And so the United States refers to one as simply nothing. They ignore the one primarily. Yeah, that's true. Um, and then the second one they refer to as the Contra War, the Contras being U.S.-backed forces that were attempting and failed to overthrow. Yeah, counter-revolutionary, hence contra. But actually, it's also important to point out that the the core of the contra was actually Somoza, the oh, dictator's um, yeah. palace Yeah, it wasn't a well. new group of people it that appeared out of the dirt. It exactly. was it was an existing people who had backed the United States yeah. against Nicaragua previously. And it, it became more complex, and that as time went on, as things do. Yeah. But um, we went on a... Uh, so there, there was, um, it's kind of all misty and distant nowadays, but there was this big old event in uh, a, a big demonstration on, against the wars in Central America, not just mm -hmm. Latin America, uh, not just Nicaragua. Right. And I came over from Britain, got involved that way. And that was 1986, I believe. Uh, I I think it was a little earlier. There were two, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm thinking. And anyway, in one of these events, um, and in those days, it's really funny, because being a British chap, a white British chap, I got, you know, I'd go up to the immigration folks, and the guy would say, oh, Mr. Baker, lovely to see you. How long do you want to stay this time? You know, and I got six months at a time. They didn't realize what was going on. But, you know, it was so funny. The, the reverse racism was so apparent. One time I was in the line coming from Chile. Everyone else was Latin American. And they were all getting hassled to death. And I get up there and they go, oh, yeah, dude, you know, welcome home almost. You know, it was really disgusting, but very helpful to me. Anyway, so... There I was popping back and forth from London, from Edinburgh. And um, Nicaragua, as the Chileans said, was where the revolution was at the time. And so I, heard, I got involved with a group of 300,000 300, from all over the world who came to Nicaragua 
to support, not so much to support the revolution as such, but it was a peace march led by a gay, guy called um, Blaise Fontaine, who had been, uh, Blaise uh, Bonpain, sorry, who had been a Marinol priest, worked in Guatemala, got defrocked and all the rest of it for daring to stand up for the poor, option for the poor, all of that good stuff. And um, I had no Spanish at the time. And we, the idea was we would march half the time on buses. <laughs> we would march through the cities and then... Much like parades today in Nicaragua, yeah, there's yeah. often a lot of vehicles involved. Yeah, because, you know, you, you, we're going from Panama to Mexico. That's a long way, dude. And, and it's we, hot. We are, and it's hot. And we had six <laughs> weeks. So, yeah, basically the idea was we had marches in appropriate places and we bust between them. And uh, so there we were, 300,000, 300 people, I wish it was 300,000. And The entire population of Panama marching up. That's what it was, man, yeah. I, I, you know, we had to trim it out for the televisions. They couldn't fit everybody. And it's like, you know, Mr. Trump. And, right, right. And, you know, how many it's people... It's like rallies in the U.S. And the, alternative, the alternative facts we all live by these days. Anyway, um, which, of course, was about tri crowd size at the inauguration, right, right, wasn't yes. it? The first alternative fact invention. Anyway, so we set off and we did various things. Curiously, and most interestingly, we came from Panama into Costa Rica and Costa Rica said, you, which is of course the touted as the great democracy of, of Central America in those days, oh, yeah. they said, you've engaged in, what was it, at the border there was an incident and so the the Costa Rican authorities said, you can only come into Costa Rica if you promise not to engage in any kind of political activity. So we had to get to Nicaragua. So we said, okay, get in our buses. We go into San Jose. We're greeted by a mob throwing stones and with, with, with cudgels and all kinds of groovy things. And we make it into this place that was a, a youth hostel we were taking over. I have to say, that sounds pretty much what it's like when you get to the bus station in San Jose today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> the, the clubs had nails in them. I'm not so sure they still have that. A little bit tamer now. Yeah, a little bit tamer. But so then, uh, Benjamin Pisa, who was the Minister of Security of, of um, Costa Rica at the time, appeared, well, he, yeah, he eventually, oh, there was the first of all, the mob was surrounding us. Then he, there suddenly it stops. He appears, he says, you've engaged in political activity, we're throwing you out of the country. Luckily, they threw us to Nicaragua and not back to Panama. So we go into Nicaragua, we, it was day after night, and it was astonishing because the, the story in the States and in Britain and everywhere else was that Costa Rica was a good democratic place, and Nicaragua was a terrible commie, commie dictatorship developing here. And we find absolutely the opposite, opposite, absolutely the opposite. And I learn a little Spanish. And we get up to the border, the northern border with Honduras, and we can't go. There's the Cobra, the special forces of Honduras are right across the Pan-American Highway, which is the, the, the main thing which goes from Alaska to uh, Tierra del Fuego, isn't yeah. it? It's this whole amazing thing. Except and for the Darien Gap. Except you can't drive through. You can't go there. That's true. They always forget to mention that, but it's true. Anyway, so here we are. So we, we are saying, but hey, we need to get up there. And some of us were going on to talk to President Reagan. So there, you know, it's really important. So I can remember us standing with our passport, British passport, saying, you know, we are British. We are the Queen, you know, well, you have to let us for one day, you know. The bombs, um, what you call these things, the tear gas, machine guns, masks, standing that line. And so we had five days. We had to form a peace camp on the border for five days and nights. And every night we had to go back from the border because there were the Contra in the hills. And the Nicaraguan army was looking out for us, but you know, you don't want to mess with the Contra. So we went back to this little school about five kilometers back. Carlos Mejia Godoy turns up. You want to say who Carlos Mejia Godoy is to the viewers? I only know the name. Oh, okay. Carlos Mejia Godoy was, how would you say, the Woody Guthrie, the Victor Jara. He was the, the poet singer of the revolution. Okay. And he had wonderful songs. One, and so he came and he sang under the stars with his little group um, with no microphones, no nothing. Three nights out of the five. 
And he sang beyond everything else, Nicaragua, ay, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, La flor malinda de Nicaragua. And that little song, I had hardly any Spanish, went boom. And it brought me back to Nicaragua to live. Five years later, I still was involved in Scotland. We had this thing, well, actually it was global. It was called the Pledge of Resistance. And it was that if the US invaded Nicaragua, which seemed to be a real possibility, we would all come and man the barricades. Yeah. So we nearly came and manned the barricades. That would have been, well, person the barricades. That would have been <laughs> unfortunate. <laughs> Probably wouldn't be doing this interview if that had happened. But anyway, so that was me tied just totally to Nicaragua. But I should go back to the LA. Why was I, I went to live in LA. And the reason was that during one of these demos, um, Ben Linda, the man we've been talking about here, was murdered in, in 1987, July of 1987. And I was wandering around, because as I say, the, being a white bloke, they had given me six months, and I'd had my demo, we'd done our demo, and I was thinking, oh, okay, I've got six months, I'll wander around. So I was doing that. And I happened to be with the publisher of the book, Song in High Summer, in, uh, which is about 60 miles, he was about living about 60 miles south of L.A. And Ben Linda's brother, Ben Linda was murdered, Ben Linda's brother, David, was giving a talk in L.A. And I drove up to it, and in the course of telling the terrible story of Ben and his two companions, Pablo Rosales and uh, Sergio Hernandez, who were murdered with him, um, a piece of paper came around, and I, this reminds me of Arlo Guthrie again, you know. <laughs> you remember, <laughs> the sergeant comes up, he's got a piece of paper in his hands. <laughs> Never mind, I won't get into that. It always makes me laugh, though. Alice's Restaurant, if anyone needs to know what I'm talking about. Um, so anyway, this piece of paper comes around, and it says, Death squads are attacking Salvadoran exiles here in Los Angeles at the moment. If you can spend even an hour to accompany them, sign the piece of paper. So, you know, I thought, well, what the hell, I may as well sign this, you know, singing cool songs is one thing. And, you know, anyway, so I signed it and it went on its way and I didn't think any more about it. A couple of days later, again, I'll go three, I get a phone call, it's Officer Obi. And this time it wasn't, it was a woman called um, Ruth, Ruth Capel from Germany who was working with the Salvadorans, and she was organizing a rota. Okay, so I, it was weird. There would be you for an hour, then there would be me for an hour, and there'd be somebody else for an hour, all of us white gringos, essentially. Uh, again, reverse racism, because if we were with the Salvadorans, the death squads would not attack. That was the theory. And so it was dreadful, because there was this little family. There was Evi, Mirna, um, Jose and their children, Stevie, Stephanie, um, Mario Nesto, and um, uh, a couple of others. And they had to, they, because Latin Americans are so hospitable, they would give everybody, you know, a drink, they would make coffee or tea, they would make sandwiches, and they were under threat by death squads, you know. So. I said, well, you know, I can stay. I'm just wandering around if it would be helpful. I hadn't really any Spanish, but I can stay with you if you like, and you don't need to have this constant rigmarole. And that's what happened. So I stayed for a week. And Janira Merino had been attacked. She was the one person they'd actually trapped and assaulted, attacked. What happened is she was at a meeting of CISPES, which was the committee, is still the Committee in Solidarity with the people of El Salvador in downtown LA. She went down from the meeting to her car and never came back. And they went down eventually and thought, what happens to Jan? And there were her keys by, by her car. And she, uh, I think it was six hours, seven hours later, she was found at the side of a freeway, practically naked, uh, tortured, mutilated, and raped with a stick, and only left alive, as the, as the message that was with her said, in order that people stop 
uh, calling on the US government not to send support to the Salvadoran military, who were, by any other name, death squads. Yeah? So, Yani had disappeared by the time I got involved. She was up in a monastery, curious enough, trying to recover. She to it took her at least three months to recover. So I was in her house, and eventually she came home, and eventually we... She wouldn't stop. That was the most amazing thing. She, she said, they said, if you don't stop, we will not only come back and kill you and all your family, but we'll behead your son in front of you. And he was three years old, Mario Ernesto. Yeah. And so she said, you know, we can't stop. So she went on national tour, if you please. And I, was, I went along with her because I had these great big muscles and I was her bodyguard. And, um, but, you know, it was the token white guy being there hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it would stop the death squads, right? And it was just astonishing. She was just so marvelous. It was just an amazing thing. And the whole family, and they all became my family. I, I still go and see them in the sun. Most of them are back in Salvador. But Janira is the most amazing story. She, to begin with, she came as an, as an illegal alien, right? And she came across the Rio Grande and all the rest of it. And um, but she had become, you know, established in L.A., and she was an organizer. She was only 22. And she had come because in El Salvador, her, one of her prophets had been murdered and dumped on their doorstep because they came from a family of activists, right? FMLN people. And so the mother, Leti, who was the real rock of the family, had come earlier and was bringing her children one by one. And Janira had to get out, so she brought her. So Yanni, having gone on this amazing, constantly for a couple of years, I was with her and I was doing carpentry in a, a, a tremendous couple. Um, uh, Jan and John Rodriguez gave us, they were fixer-uppers, they were fixing up old houses uh -huh. in LA. So they gave us, uh, wherever they had a house, we could, that was our safe house. And because they were always in white neighborhoods, we were pretty safe. But we were always there with, you know, in case of the death squad. So anyway, so we went on these tours and, and went over even to Britain and all kinds of things. And then, Yanni got together with, with uh, her compañero. They started a baby. So she thought she should get a proper job. So she could, the only job she found she could get in Los Angeles was in a shrimp processing plant. Okay, so she gets into this job. And she's there a little while. And she says, you know what these guys need? They need a union. And you know why I know that? It's because when we were in Berlin, in, 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 it's in New Hampshire, isn't it? In the north of okay, uh, yep. New Hampshire. Um, we went to, a, it's a union town, and I remember we went there, you and I, Paul. And we thought we should sing a union song. When the only, and I, we, and the, only na the only song we could think of was, I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night. So we, we sang Joe Hill. And when she was in the shrimp processing plant, she remembered hearing Joe Hill. This, we need a union. So she organized a union and got in the professional union organizers. They managed to get them to the vote, right? The vote, the union in. They came in. They were so impressed with her work as an organizer, they hired her. And now she is the national coordinator for immigrant workers of the Laborers International Union of North America, which is one of the biggest wow. unions, Laiuna, right? And so her next step up would be to be vice president and or president, which she deserves because she's astonishing. And so there you are. That, what a tremendous story. And of course, she's been paying taxes. She's been, you know, assisting the workers. So she's actually, as an illegal alien originally, contributing hugely, which is, of course, what the people who do immigrate, right. immigrate, do because they they they're more law-abiding than 
the regular citizens because they don't want to get deported and they pay Not all to be self-serving but we're both immigrants here yeah I, that's <laughs> right yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's we're, we're very valuable here yes it's, we are we're, indeed we're, yes <laughs> indeed but it's even true even more true in the united states which of course you know the reality is that migration migration will continue because we northern white folks old white white guys are destroying the planet which means we're driving a huge number of people off their land where are they to go going to go. They're going to come north. Most of them, an awful lot of them, the waves will get bigger. And it's, it's due to us. It's down to us largely because we have destroyed, for example, Nicaragua. We try to destroy it every day. Every day of, the, yep. of, of our northern lives. We, if we would only pay, I love saying this, if we would only pay, if we would only ensure that a proper proportion of Starbucks coffee or any other coffee brands comes to the worker here in Nicaragua, Nobody would be leaving Nicaragua. Yeah, so there, that's an easy, easy thing to do. Okay, <laughs> so anyway, there we are. That's how, so there was Yanire. And all of that then coalesced into, yeah, well, this song coming to Nicaragua and the heat, which I absolutely hate, <laughs> coming from Scotland. <laughs> and here we are. And, here, and I've been here now since 92, essentially, officially but really count it back to that time on the border with Honduras when Carlos came and sang Nicaragua, Nicaraguita. And I have a, more stories, of course. I wrote, I went home, wrote an English version of it, and Carlos and I were singing it on the radio a few years later, you know. It was amazing. It was tremendous. And Nicaragua was like that, by the way. Carlos was a superstar in Nicaragua, and even internationally. But you would find him in the airport standing next to you. He wasn't, you know, you wouldn't be surrounded by people resisting you. Know? And he would say, yeah, let's sing it together, man. We're, I've got to do a thing on, on the radio for some benefit it was. And he said, whoa, guy, you did it in English. Let's do it, man. And we just, there we were, boom, like that, just like you, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing. Nicaragua is, the, life, the quality of life is so, Human. That's what I love about it most. That you know, everybody, even Daniel is called Daniel, and Rosario, the vice president, is called Rosario. You don't really say you know, who the president. Uh, nobody has titles. No one has. Mm -hmm. you know. And in the airport, I don't know if you noticed, there isn't a, there isn't a um, photo or picture of Daniel, the president. There's Ruben Darío, the great poet right. of Nicaragua, yeah? and Sandino. Yeah. Yeah, and then where's Daniel? Everywhere in Britain, every official building has got the Queen or had the Queen. Now it's got old Charlie Boy, presumably. Uh, well, we have lots of opportunity. We could get you yeah. back on the show. Yeah. That would be yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I need I need to edit this, obviously. Yeah. It's going to be. Yeah. We actually to have two cameras, which is nice. Chop uh, it around. That's for, yeah. But that's um, what whatever you want to do with it, it's fine yeah. with me. But I would, if it is possible, to yeah. come back because I think for the sure. story of. I like to contrast and compare Che Guevara. Mm hmm. And Sandino, Augusto yep. Sandino. Che is really the revolutionary hero of the last century. Uh, Sandino is this revolutionary hero of, the, hero of this century. Why? Because when he got rid of the gringos, he didn't do what most military guys do, like Eisenhower, for example. Doesn't go on to become president. He founds a land-based cooperative with gender equal, no money, living off the land, education for all, health care for all. And that is the model the world of today absolutely needs. And so he is the revolutionary. He is the first, I like to say, the first real rainbow warrior. So I'd love to do another little session on that. Yeah, because for sure. The, I mean, this is where everybody is at now. I mean, for goodness sake, using a UF is dead. Where's everybody at? What the hell is that? This is where <laughs> everybody is, I should say. Um, Charlie would not be happy with me. Um, that, you know, we're all suffering the effects of global catastrophe. It's not even warming. It's not even crisis. It's an emergency. And Nicaragua has a wonderful model to offer and a wonderful hero to follow with a big hat it's so a big hat. you can you bet him a big hat man you know i'm, I'm kind of a hat guy yeah all I right can see that. <laughs> my beautiful blue one man that's what i did with it 
Anyway, Sandino is famous for his hat, in case you're all worrying about it. Yes, he he's very, very famous for a very large hat. Yeah, that's right. We, we, we like to talk about Nicaragua being sort of haunted by a hat. <laughs> you have to see. You should maybe show the <laughs> I should. silhouette. I should. I, that yes, would be, I will that find would one. Kind of good. You know, right. the big one on, on Somoza's Mound. You know yes. What I mean? Oh, yes. That's quite impressive. That is a good one. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. Paul, thanks for joining us today. I hope we get to have you back soon beyond the upcoming Nika Roomba interview. Yeah. Uh, for everyone, thanks for uh, joining us today. Remember to like and subscribe if you'd like to help support the channel. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to us, helps us fund everything that we do here, the cameras and the microphones and all yeah, that kind of stuff, right. and the travel, which is obviously uh, quite a bit. Really appreciate uh, all of you who joined us. Be sure to share on social media, tell family and friends about the show. And uh, as always, I will see everyone tomorrow. And on the screen, there's going to be four videos. Just, you know, pick one that looks interesting. Or if none of these suit your fancy, take a look. We have my channel, Immense Coffee Movement, and others that have lots of information about Nicaragua. Choose one of those. It helps tell uh, YouTube that this show has uh, piqued your interest.